Okay, I'm recording this lecture about some of the mysteries of quantum mechanics. Since we can't meet in person, I'm going to upload this to the campus website. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the things that uh, David Albert discussed in his chapter, but uh, I can't cover everything, so you have to read the chapter. Um, this is an interesting phenomenon that occurs in, um, in nature and is explained by quantum mechanics. So first, there's a property that electrons have called their spin. And the way this property manifests itself is basically um, if you have an electron go through a non-uniform magnetic field, it will get deflected by a certain amount by the magnetic field. It will either get deflected up or it will get deflected down, uh, always by the same amount. And half the electrons go up and half of them go down. The ones that go up are said to be spin up and the ones that go down are said to be spin down. Now, uh, electrons have a spin in each direction in space, so you can change the orientation of, um, of, the mag of the magnet that is used to detect the spin. You can change its orientation and you can get different results as to whether the electron is spin up or spin down in different directions. Okay, so spin in the x direction is completely uncorrelated with spin in the y direction. So if you take measurements in two orthogonal directions, there's no correlation at all between the measurement results. But uh, if, you take, if you take directions that differ by less than 90 degrees, then there's some correlation. Okay, um, so uh, every electron is spin up in the x direction or spin down and spin up or spin down in the y direction and also the z direction. Here's some things about um, the measurement of this. So we can call this an X-spin box. It's a device that measures the X-spin, basically just this kind of magnet called a stern gerlach magnet. Uh, and it will send spin up electrons out in one direction and spin down electrons out in another direction. Similarly for a Y-spin box. By the way, a Y-spin box is just an X-spin box rotated 90 degrees. Uh, if you do successive measurements of the same spin property, you get the same result. So you measure the X spin of a particle and then you measure the X spin again and it's the same as the first measurement 100% of the time. However, if you measure the spin in one direction and then measure the spin in, a, in an orthogonal direction, then uh, you've, there's no correlation. Uh, also, if you measure the spin in, X, in the X direction and then measure the spin in the Y direction, that completely disrupts the X spin. So if after measuring the Y spin, you then measure the X spin again, it's been randomized. So there's a 50% chance of coming out X spin up and 50% chance of coming out X spin down. Uh, so, some, so Y spin measurements disrupt X spin and X spin measurements also completely disrupt Y spin. Now, uh, so this, this diagram illustrates some of the things that I was just saying. So if you feed a bunch of electrons into the X-spin box in the lower left here, half of them will go out being X-spin up, and half of them will come out being X-spin down. If you feed the X-spin up electrons into a Y-spin box, half of them will come out Y-spin up, and half of them will come out Y-spin down. That is irrespective of what state they were in at the bottom down here. So if you had Y spin up electrons, after they go through the X spin box, they're completely randomized. So half of them will be Y spin up and half of them will be Y spin down. Similarly, on this other path, um, on the lower path, the X spin down electrons, after being fed into a Y spin box, half of them will come out Y spin up and half of them will come out Y spin down. Okay, so that's good. So, so this is another device that you could have that um, you can think about what would happen if we had this. So there's an X-spin box at the bottom here, and uh, you can feed electrons in. Half of them go out X-spin up. Then the X-spin up electrons bounce off a mirror on the upper path. They get reflected over to point E. The X-spin down electrons go on this lower path. They bounce off a mirror, and they wind up at the same place at point E then all of the electrons at, from point E get fed into a Y-spin box. And what should happen? Uh, you should expect if you fed Y-spin up electrons into the X-spin box, when they go into the X-spin box, they should be completely randomized in terms of Y-spin. 
So half of them should go on the upper, upper path and half of them should go on the lower path, but whichever path they went on, their Y-spin should have been disrupted. So when they get into the Y-spin box, half of them should come out Y-spin up and half of them should come out Y-spin down. And that is not actually what happens. What actually happens is whatever the Y-spin of the electrons was down at the bottom when they got fed in, they will have the same Y-spin when they come out at the top here. So if Y spin up electrons go into this, um, whatever happens, somehow they get to point E, they wind up being all Y spin up. If you feed Y spin down electrons into this device, they somehow get through the device on one path or the other, or somehow they wind up at E, and then they wind up all Y spin down like they were at the beginning. And that's a strange situation. So this is what David Albert says about this. Uh, you're trying to figure out how the electron got from the bottom to the top. Did it take the upper path or the lower path or something else? And it looks as if the electron doesn't simply take the upper path because if you block the lower path, then um, all the electrons coming through are going to be X spin up and their Y spin is going to be randomized, whatever their state was uh, at the beginning. So if they were Y spin up, they go into the device. If you block the lower path, then their Y spin gets randomized and they come out being half of them Y spin up and half of them Y spin down at the end. Uh, also, if you put some kind of electron detector to find out which path an electron takes through the device, then um, the result of that is their Y spin gets disrupted and completely randomized. So, uh, so at the end, there will be 50% Y up and 50% Y down. Um, uh, but if you put an electron detector, you will find half the time you'll find the electron on the upper path and half the time you'll find it on the lower path. Okay, it looks like the electron doesn't simply take the lower path for the same reasons. So if you block the lower path, then half the electrons don't get through, only half of them get through, um, and, uh, and you disrupt the effect. Also, it doesn't look like you should say the electron takes both paths, although it might kind of seem that way because somehow um, there's an effect of both paths being present. But the electron doesn't take both paths because if you put some kind of electron detector, you never find something on both paths. If there's an electron detector, it always finds an electron on one path or the other. You never find two electrons. You don't find half an electron on one path and half on the other path or anything like that. Uh, it's always on one path or the other. But it doesn't look like you should say that the electron takes neither path either. Um, because uh, if, you, if you block both paths, then nothing will get through. Uh, if you put in a, an electron detector, uh, you always find it on one of the paths. You don't never find it in the middle. Uh, it doesn't look like it teleports from one end to the other because if you block the paths, then they wouldn't get through. So what's happening? Um, well, we don't know exactly what's happening, but we, we call this a superposition. So the electron is on a superposition of the upper path and the lower path, uh, whatever that means. It means this weird situation in which um, the two paths, somehow there's an effect of having both of them open, um, but you can't identify which path it took, but you also can't say it didn't take either. Okay, now there's a very famous experiment, um, more famous experiment in quantum mechanics known as the double slit experiment which you might have heard of before. And um, Albert doesn't talk about this because the explanation of it is more complicated, right? Albert's example, though, illustrates kind of the same phenomenon as what's going on in, in the double slit experiment. It's the same kind of puzzle, uh, but it's just that the uh, quantum mechanical representation of it is more complicated. But this is what happens in, in the double slit experiment. So there's a wall with two slits in it. Um, you send some light or electrons or some kind of particles towards the wall uh, and the light can get through one, one or both of the slits and then behind that there's a screen where you can see where the particles hit the screen. And then you record where they hit the screen and you, you can make a graph of the probability of a particle hitting at any given place on the screen. So this is what you, what you see. 
Um, if you just have one slit open and you close the other slit, then the distribution of particles reaching the screen should look like this. So there should be a hump in the middle. This is representing that most of the light will come out near this part of the screen opposite from the slit that's open, which is intuitively obvious. Less of the light will come out as you get um, at parts farther away from the position opposite from the slit. If you close the first slit and open the second slit, then you get a distribution that looks like that, but with the with a hump centered on the part of the screen that's opposite from the second slit. And that's intuitively obvious. You should expect that. If you open both slits, this is what you should expect to see. You should expect to see um, in part C here a combination of the distribution from part A and the distribution from B. You should expect that you could add these two together and then the distribution in C would be the sum of those. Uh, but that's not what happens. What actually happens is a distribution that looks like part D where there are some parts that are brighter and then there are some parts that are darker than you would expect in C. Now what's going on here? So uh, this is what it actually looks like. So the previous slide was uh, showing a, a graph showing the probability of light reaching different parts of the screen. This is what it would actually physically look like. So if you have light hitting the screen, um, there are bright parts in the middle and dark parts in between the bright spots. Okay, what's happening here is this is an interference pattern. So this is a diagram illustrating what happens with interference patterns. So basically there are light, there are waves, waves of light or some kind of particle that are spreading out from where the two slits are. And then so as they spread out, the light from the two different slits can, the light waves can overlap. In some places where they overlap, um, you get brighter spots. So if the if a crest of one wave overlaps with a crest of another wave, then you get an extra bright spot. Basically, you get a wave with double the amplitude. If the crest of one wave overlaps with a trough of the other wave, then they cancel each other out. So then you get um, parts that are like having no wave there at all. And then uh, if a trough of one wave overlaps with a trough of the other wave, then you get a trough that's twice as deep. So you get an extra um, uh, extra bright um, uh, wave in the, in the opposite direction. Okay, uh, so um, what this looks like is the interference pattern occurs because the light or stream of electrons or some other particles is actually a wave phenomenon. And uh, that could be the only explanation for why you would get an interference pattern on the screen. Now you wonder um, which, which slit does the particle or the light go through? Well, if you try to measure what slit it goes through, then you always find it at one slit or the other. If you do some kind of measurement on the location of the photon or the electron or whatever, you don't find it in between. You never find it at both places. You always find it going through one slit or the other. But um, if you don't do any measure, so if you do a measurement, then it acts like it's a particle and it appears at one slit or the other when, when going through the, through the device. Uh, and then also the interference pattern will not appear. However, if you don't try to measure the location of it, then it acts like a particle. So it acts like there's a wave that's going through both slits and then parts of the wave are interfering with parts, um, com parts from each slit are interfering with a part from the other slit. Right, so this is similar to the case of the electron spin puzzle where it looks like the particle is in a superposition. Uh, you can't just say that it goes through the one slit or the other slit. It matters if both of them are open, um, but if you ever try to measure its location, then you find it on one or the other. So it's not exactly that it's not going through either of them, but you can't, can't exactly say that it's just going through one of them. Okay, so that's the mystery. 
that leads to all of the weird stuff in quantum mechanics. So the weird things that you hear about in quantum mechanics about reality being indeterminate and observers creating reality is all based upon these extremely strange experimental results. And uh, so we're going to talk about that more. Um, in the, next, uh, in the next presentation, I will talk about some of the uh, mathematical formalism that's used to predict these experimental results. And then after that, we'll have um, discussion of how all of this should be interpreted. So what is the explanation of what's going on in underlying reality?